In this video, we're going to discuss whether the glycemic index of our diet matters for our health. We're going to look at the literature, consider why foods differ in the glycemic index, and discuss an important limitation of the glycemic index that we need to be conscious of if we want to use the glycemic index of our diet to our benefit. Hi there, welcome. If we haven't met yet, my name is Mario, and on this channel we're discussing evidence-based nutrition as it relates to the prevention of chronic disease. In this video, we're going to address the question of whether the glycemic index of our diet matters for our health. If you have watched other videos or read articles about the glycemic index, you may have noticed that many people argue that the glycemic index is useless. The points raised are often factually correct, but I still disagree with the conclusion. I do think that there is some value in the glycemic index, but there are a few things we need to know about and consider to make it really useful. That's what I'm hoping to achieve with this video. The first thing we're going to do is take a look at what the scientific literature can tell us about whether the glycemic index matters for health. The available data do suggest that eating a high glycemic index when compared to a low glycemic index diet slightly increases the risks of type 2 diabetes, coronary heart disease, and bladder, breast, and colorectal cancer. I'm saying suggest because all of these findings are based on observational studies, and so we can never be certain that the observed associations are reflective of a cause-effect relationship. The way these observational studies are done is that usually thousands or tens of thousands of people are ordered by the glycemic index of their diet, and then the investigators group them into four or five groups. We call this quartiles or quintiles. Then they follow these participants for many years and assess how many develop certain diseases. Based on meta-analyses, meaning studies of many such observational studies, the data suggests that the risk of developing type 2 diabetes is 19% higher in people eating a high glycemic index diet compared to those eating a low glycemic index diet. So basically comparing the quintile or quartile with the highest glycemic index versus the quintile or quartile with the lowest glycemic index. Similarly, the risk of coronary heart disease is 14% higher in those eating a high glycemic index diet. For breast cancer, it's 6% higher. For colorectal cancer, 8% higher. And for bladder cancer, 26% higher in those eating diets with the highest glycemic index. What about intervention studies? In intervention studies, high glycemic index diets also lead to slightly higher body weight, higher blood pressure, and likely higher insulin resistance when compared to low glycemic index diets. Because all of these are risk factors for type 2 diabetes and or coronary heart disease, this strengthens our confidence that the associations seen in observational studies may be reflective of actual cause-effect relationships. Now, these numbers look pretty modest. It's not like your risk of type 2 diabetes or heart disease is two or three times higher if you eat a high compared to a low glycemic index diet. So you may be wondering whether it's worthwhile to pay any attention to the glycemic index. I say yes, we should, and suggest that the impact of the glycemic index on our health could actually be a lot more substantial than current evidence suggests. Why do I say that? Well, to explain my thinking and how I am using the glycemic index, let's look at why foods differ in the glycemic index and why that is relevant for long-term health outcomes. The hypothesis underlying all of this research is that eating high glycemic foods would be expected to give us more substantial blood sugar spikes compared to eating a diet with an overall lower glycemic index, and that these differences throughout the day are then what causes the higher risks of disease on high glycemic index diets. Well, the data we just reviewed seem to support that, but we need to be careful and acknowledge that the data do not actually show this in any conclusive fashion. Let's imagine what the diet of someone who eats mostly high glycemic index foods looks like. They may eat a lot of white rice, instant oatmeal, cornflakes, white flour bread, baked potatoes, beer and soda, and baked goods. The overall glycemic index of such a diet would obviously depend on all of the foods eaten, and in which proportion. But to make my point, let's just take the average of those eight foods. That overall glycemic index would be 83. Compare that to the diet of someone who eats a low glycemic uh, index diet. 
let's say sourdough rye bread, oatmeal made from steel cut oats, lots of beans and lentils, boiled sweet potatoes, starchy vegetables such as parsnips and carrots, and maybe some dairy foods. Let's assume they're eating the same amount of total carbs, but they just focus on lower glycemic options. The overall glycemic index of these foods is 43. Now there's two important things we can notice here. The first thing is that these foods really differ in a lot of ways. And glycemic index is just one of these. For example, a low glycemic diet typically has a lot more fiber and micronutrients. So we need to acknowledge that it remains unclear from all of the research we discussed earlier why health outcomes are better on low glycemic index diets. Is it really because our blood sugar levels are lower when we eat low glycemic index foods, as we hypothesized earlier? Or do other factors, such as the higher content of fiber or different vitamins and minerals, also play a role? We don't really know for sure. The second thing we notice is that the glycemic indices of these two diets are vastly different, by 40 units. Contrast that to the mean difference in most observational studies, which is usually less than 10 units between the highest versus the lowest glycemic index category, like here in the well-known Nurses Health study, for example. But there's another complicating factor. Take a look at this second low glycemic index diet that I have created here. Exactly the same low glycemic index, but now all of these foods are actually sugary treats and syrups. How does that make any sense? Well, we need to understand why foods differ in their glycemic index. The first factor that lowers the glycemic index is this. Foods that contain some protein or fiber or fat along with carbohydrates tend to have a lower glycemic index because protein, fiber, and fat tend to slow down the digestion and absorption of carbohydrates. Lentils or beans, for example, contain fairly high amounts of both protein and fiber, and so they have a much lower glycemic index than, say, white rice, cornflakes, or potatoes, all of which consist mostly of easily digestible starch. The second factor that lowers the glycemic index is something entirely different, though. Remember that when we calculate the glycemic index of a food, we measure changes in the blood glucose concentration after eating that food. Therefore, foods with a high glycemic index tend to be those that are rich in glucose, mostly in the form of starch, because starch is just a chain of glucose molecules. Foods that contain carbohydrates other than glucose tend to have a lower glycemic index, simply because there's less glucose that can enter the bloodstream after these foods. An example for this is the main carbohydrate in dairy foods, lactose, which is only 50% glucose and 50% galactose. You know, galactose being another simple sugar. The second example is fructose. Fructose can be found as a simple sugar in fruit and fruit juices, but also in many concentrated sugars and syrups. These include table sugar, which consists of 50% glucose and 50% fructose. Uh, high fructose corn syrup is another rich source, agave syrup, maple syrup, and honey. So when we are calculating the glycemic index, people eat 50 grams of available carbohydrates. In the case of rice, cornflakes, and potatoes, you know, all high glycemic index foods, that's almost 50 grams of glucose in the form of starch. In the case of agave syrup, which is usually about 90% fructose and 10% glucose, only about 5 grams in the form of glucose and 45 grams in the form of fructose. So obviously blood glucose levels are going to rise less substantially after eating agave syrup, and that's why agave syrup has such a low glycemic index. If we were to look at blood fructose levels, though, it would be a different matter. But we don't consider this when we're calculating the glycemic index. Now, you may ask, are blood fructose levels relevant as well? I think so. Even though the liver filters out much of the fructose we absorb, and as a result, fructose levels in circulating blood tend to be much lower than circulating glucose levels. But the fructose then accumulates in the liver and the liver has to deal with it, so that's probably not a good thing if we're you know, eating a lot of fructose. That's a different conversation for another time though. For now, let's just say that I guess most people would agree that aside from its low glycemic index, agave syrup is certainly not a health food uh, if it's eaten in large quantities. Mostly agave syrup, just like table sugar, maple syrup, high fructose corn syrup, and even honey, they are dense sources of calories that don't add much nutritional value. Now, the fact that the dietary glycemic index could be lowered by eating more agave syrup or maple syrup has led many people, both in academia and on social media, to the conclusion that the glycemic index is useless. I disagree. 
I'll repeat what I said in the last video. It's just important not to use the glycemic index by itself as the only measure of the overall healthfulness of a food. What I would suggest instead is that we don't use the low glycemic index as an excuse to eat a lot of added sugars and syrups. In other words, let's minimize high glycemic index foods and instead eat more whole foods with a low glycemic index that are not fructose bombs. How about fruit and dairy then? Both have a low glycemic index partly because they contain carbohydrates other than glucose. Fructose in the case of fruit, galactose in the case of dairy. In my mind, it's a good guiding criterion here to look at whether the food has, you know, other nutritional value. I think whole fruit and whole dairy foods are clearly nutritious foods in many ways. I have myself published many papers on dairy and one review article on fruit. And looking at the cumulative evidence, whole fruit and berries, as well as milk, yogurt and cheese are not associated with negative health outcomes. So to me personally, they're, they're fine. They offer other health benefits other than, you know, just having a low glycemic index because they're rich in galactose and fructose. And then there's another limitation of the glycemic index that I haven't touched on. The glycemic index of foods or diets doesn't consider in which combination foods are eaten. We'll discuss in the next video how we can eat high glycemic index foods such as a baked potato or white rice in a way that minimizes the impact on blood sugar levels. I said earlier that I think the glycemic index may be more important for our health than is reflected in the current literature. What if we compared high glycemic index diets that are so typical of what many people eat these days to low glycemic index diets that are also low in fructose from added sugars and syrups? My best guess is that the differences in health outcomes would be much more substantial than what we are seeing in the published literature now. So how do I use this information? I personally see the glycemic index as one factor to inform my diet, even though it's not perfect and it certainly should not be considered by itself. There are lots of other aspects that make up a healthy diet. The first conclusion I draw from these data is that it's almost certainly a good idea to minimize the consumption of high glycemic index foods, at least by themselves. What do we call high glycemic index here? I'd say any food with a glycemic index of 60 or more. With regard to blood sugar levels, eating these foods by themselves is similar to eating pure sugar. Second, I do eat high glycemic index foods such as rice or potatoes pretty regularly, but never by themselves, which we would call naked carbs. I eat them only as part of a meal with other foods that have a lot of fiber, protein, and fat, all of which minimizes the overall blood sugar response. And third, I minimize the consumption of fructose-rich foods, such as table sugar, agave syrup, maple syrup, honey, and the like. Basically everything we would use to sweeten other foods. And that is even though these foods have a low glycemic index. In summary, we have seen that eating a diet with a high glycemic index is associated with an increased risk of type 2 diabetes, coronary heart disease, and certain types of cancer, specifically breast, colorectal, and bladder cancer. There are also data from intervention trials showing that a high, when compared to a low glycemic index diet, also slightly increases body weight, blood pressure, and likely insulin resistance. We have also discussed that these effects are seen even though existing studies are a bit limited in some ways. For one, the range of glycemic indices in different groups that are being compared is fairly narrow, suggesting that people who make a more substantive change in their diet could reasonably expect greater benefits. Existing studies also usually don't take into consideration that fructose in added sugars has a low glycemic index, meaning that low glycemic index diets in both observational and interventional studies could partly have that low glycemic index because they contain a lot of fructose. In my opinion, a low glycemic index diet that is also low in fructose from added sugars or syrups is likely a better choice than one that partly achieves that low glycemic index by including a lot of fructose. That's it for this video. As always, you can find more detail along with all references in the blog post associated with this video. The link is in the description below. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up and make sure you're subscribed to the channel if you're interested in content about nutrition as it relates to chronic disease prevention. Till next time, bye-bye.